أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh dear brothers and sisters May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our fasts and prayers and deeds during this holy month And inshaAllah with the coming down of the snow The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also showers down upon us <laughs> To continue from where we left off last night we begin with discussing the three levels pertaining to the religion and the religious laws that come with it. And just a quick recap about what we talked about yesterday. It was mentioned that there are three levels to every religious commandment or ordinance. And we compared it to that of a seed. There's an outer shell for religion, and that is the laws and the perimeters that are defining what the religion is. The do's and the don'ts. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. Those are don'ts and do's. Examples of that are pray, pray, go to Hajj, do your pilgrimage, give charity, and so on and so forth. The jurists, or the schools of the jurists, those who care more about the law than anything else, say that by performing these laws, we fulfill the goodness that God wants us to have from them. Why do we pray? Because there's goodness in prayer. So we do that. The other school, on the, on the other hand, which is the school of the mystics, and they tend to go more towards the spiritual aspect of understanding things without foregoing the law. They say that when we pray, when we fast, when we perform pilgrimage, when we do charity, we are supposed to derive spiritual benefits from these. This is why we perform these things. So they don't believe that just by performing prayer that you get the, pray, the, the benefit itself, no. Performing it is good, it gives you some benefit, but we have to go beyond that. We have to be able to contemplate and think and use prayer to elevate ourselves spiritually. That's the second level. So the first level was performing the prayer, which is the sharia. The second level is contemplating and thinking and benefiting from the prayer, which is tariqah. And the third level is to reach some spiritual realizations, and this is the haqiqa. The Prophet ﷺ describes salat as being ma'raj al-mu'min, the ascent of the believer. Prayer is supposed to make us ascend up to the spiritual world. So we have to experience this. It's a state that we're able to experience internally if we contemplate and pray correctly. When it comes to fasting, the same is true. So inshallah we're going to go through these rulings pertaining to fasting and today we're going to begin with the definition of fasting. What is fasting? How do we define it? When it comes to the ruling itself, the jurists have defined fasting as abstaining from the things that invalidate our fast. So not doing things that break our fast from Fajr prayer until sunset, until Maghrib. So during that period of time, we're supposed to abstain from things that invalidate the fast. And they've listed about seven plus or minus things. Eating example is one example. Drinking is another example. And being intimate with your spouse, a certain type of intimacy is also an example. Lying, attributing something to God or the Prophet or the Imams, well, it's not true. That breaks your fast as well, and so on and so forth. 
So when it comes to looking at fasting, let's try to analyze it. Let's try to think what type of action is fasting when we compare it to other actions that religion tells us to do. We have Salat, for example. Prayer is doing something, right? You stand up, you bow down, you prostrate. It involves some sort of activity. <clears throat> so when you pray, there's a beginning for the prayer and there's an end for the prayer. You can clearly say that this is a form of prayer. Going to Hajj for pilgrimage. You walk there, you go to Mecca, you have to do certain rituals and certain rites. Once you finish those, you finish performing Hajj. It's an action and you're doing something. Fasting on the other hand, does it involve doing something or does it involve not doing something? Here the jurists have a discussion between each other. Some of them say that fasting is only abstention. So when you say someone is fasting, it means that they're not eating, they're not drinking, they're not doing this stuff. It's a negative. Others say no, fasting is an act. Because every time you think of eating, you have to stop yourself. That's an action. So there's a difference of opinion. But we're not going to get into this discussion because it's not really going to help us. And it's really about technical details that we're not concerned with. But we're going to take that fasting is an abstention. And we're going, to, we're going to try to analyze abstaining from things, how it differs from doing things. In life, we can divide our actions or our behaviors into two parts. There are things that we do, and there are things that we stay away from. What's the difference between the two? Why do we do things at times, like giving charity, and why do we abstain from certain things at certain times? Is it better to always do things or is it better to always abstain from doing things? Is it better for me not to do haram, things that are impermissible? Or is it better for me to do something that's wajib or obligatory? So let's say I decide that I don't want to commit any sin, but I also don't want to pray and I don't want to fast and I don't want to do these things. Do I get rewarded for that? Is that a good thing? Or does religion tell us that we have to do these two functions because each one has a different benefit from the other. Not doing things also has an effect on the soul. Whereas doing things also has an effect on the soul, but the effects are different. They're not the same. When it comes to spirituality, the mystics say that in order to walk on the spiritual path, the first thing that you have to do is you have to purify yourself. They call it a takhliya. Takhliya means to empty. A takhliya, thumma takhliya. First you do takhliya, you empty, and then you beautify yourself. If you have a room in the house that's full, filled with clutter and it's dirty and it has a lot of things that are unorganized, if you want to beautify that room, and you want to put new furniture in and fix it, you have to remove all the clutter from inside. That's the first step. You can't get new furniture and try to put it in a room that's already dirty and messed up. So the first step that we have to do involves the self-purification. And once we do that, we open up the room to be able to contemplate, to be able to pray properly, to be able to think properly. They complement each other, these two things. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. If we look at abstention, we can think that by not doing something wrong, what kind of effect does it have on the individual? So for example, if I wake up in the morning and throughout the whole day, I don't lie. Do I get rewarded for that? Does it have an effect on me if I don't hurt someone throughout the whole day? Or is it only my actions that have an effect on me? By saying the truth, for example. Because if we think about it, there's a million bad things that we can do throughout the day that we don't do. Is that helping us? Does that have a benefit for us? Or does it keep us in a neutral state? Well, if we look at the hadith, it seems that 
if we look, for example, at the hadith that talks about silence, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, when it comes to speaking, لَا يَزَالُ الْعَبْدُ الْمُؤْمِنْ يَكْتَبُ مُحْسِنًا مَا دَامَ سَاكِتًا فَإِذَا تَكَلَّمَ كُتِبَ مُحْسِنًا أَوْ مُسِيئًا As long as the believer is silent, he is written down as a good doer. Once that person speaks, then either that good continues to be written down, or evil begins to be written down. So this hadith tells us that by not doing wrong things, we do get rewarded spiritually. By abstaining from doing wrong, we do benefit spiritually. <clears throat> Think about it in a way of pre uh, preserving your health. You know, you must have all heard of the common principle that was um, mentioned thousands of years ago in the traditional medicine that prevention is better than cure, right? If you prevent yourself from eating unhealthy foods, then it's better than, in order to preserve your health, it's better than getting sick than trying to cure yourself. Can we agree that this is a proper principle, a rational principle? that we can apply in our lives. So abstention acts that way as well. By not performing certain deeds, what we're doing is we're strengthening ourselves just like we're strengthening our bodies if we don't eat unhealthy foods. By staying away from unhealthy foods, we're allowing our body to function in a better way. That way we have less illnesses, we have less diseases, and then we don't have to worry about curing ourselves after we get sick. So fasting, in one sense, helps us do that. This is one of the benefits that we get from abstaining from doing wrong things. Another benefit that we get is that we gain control over our minds and our thoughts and our passions and desires. When I'm unable to eat food and I stop myself from eating that food, I'm taking control of my life. Because throughout the day, if I'm not fasting, Usually I go after food whenever I feel like I'm craving something. I go after a drink whenever I crave it. I don't have control over myself. And having that control over yourself helps you in almost every level in your life. Not just when it comes to food or drinking. When it comes to relationships, for example. If you're in a fight with somebody and you get into an argument, we usually have a very difficult time controlling our tongues. We say things, and then we regret it, and then we try to fix it. But sometimes the damage that we do from what we speak and what we say is very difficult to fix. The ideas that we put in the minds of our partners or children or parents or our friends sometimes are too harmful. So is it better not to say something bad to a person? Or is it better to say something harmful than apologize for it and try to repent and regret? Obviously not doing the mistake is much better because you maintain that healthy type of relationships. You don't lower it to a degree that you might not be able to elevate it to again. So by abstaining from certain things, we gain control over our thoughts. We gain strength over our minds. We're able to strengthen our willpower. This is why if you want to strengthen your willpower, what the scholars say to do is, whenever you crave something, you don't give your nest that thing. The objective is not to eat that thing you're craving. Let's say I crave something very sweet today. I want to go have a donut. There's nothing wrong with having donuts. Donuts are amazing, they're very tasty, they're wonderful. I mean, they're not very healthy, but from other aspects, they're very good. The scholars here don't care about the donut. They don't say, when you crave it, stop yourself from having it because the donut itself is bad. No. They're trying to build an inner strength inside of yourself. That you decide what you do. So you crave something and you say, I'm not going to have that thing. The first time it's hard. Second time a bit easier. Third time a bit easier. Until you reach a point where you are not inclined towards it anymore. But you can decide whether you want to have that thing or not. So this is another thing that we benefit from by abstaining from certain things. Another benefit is strengthening our desires, but in the right path. And this is something that we could think about and analyze. 
by not craving or not sorry by not eating and not having drinks what we're doing is we're increasing our desire and passion for that thing now how does this work is this a good thing or not for example if I'm not fasting and I have breakfast or I have lunch or I have dinner I might enjoy it maybe 50 or 60 percent but if I'm fasting that whole day and that if thought comes on the table it could be something that I don't usually crave or enjoy so much during my ordinary life. But when I'm fasting, suddenly putting that food in my mouth brings a thousand times more pleasure into my mouth. This is something that's very good, it's not bad. Why? Because it allows us to experience life in a much deeper way. The same thing, I mean, if we look at Roman history. I'm not sure if anybody here heard of uh, Papea. She was a, let's call her a princess. She was the wife of one of the Roman emperors. And Papea used to walk in the streets of Rome. Her face was uncovered. There's a statue that they have of her. And when she used to walk in the streets of Rome, the men used to look at her face. And they said that she was a very beautiful woman. They would look at her, they would enjoy that beauty of her face, and Papaya liked that. She enjoyed that her beauty was being shown. But she wanted more. She wanted to enjoy a stronger sense of that appreciation of her beauty. So the next day, she came out and she veiled her face. Suddenly, her face became more attractive than it was the day before because her face was showing people were interested in other things but now that she covered her face even though they've seen it the day before now that it's covered they're craving it and they're appreciating its beauty even more this is part of human nature we desire that which we cannot have and this is nothing wrong in this sometimes we can think about hijab in that way as well by veiling herself the woman becomes more attractive when you're able to marry that person or be with that person that intensifies the experience with that other individual and this is a beautiful way we can understand God revealing certain laws and wanting us to enjoy the pleasures in this world as well in the famous hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when talking when talking about the person who is fasting, he says that the person who fasts has two occasion, occasions of joy. One when he breaks his fast and one when he meets his Lord. The sa'imi farhatan. Farhatun anda fitr wa farhatun anda liqa'i rabbi. The Prophet expresses iftar, breaking your fast, as a moment of joy and compares it to the joy of meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how intense it is. So it's not only to make us not like food or not enjoy food or trying to deprive us of things. No. It's very important for us in this life if we, we are to enjoy a blessing that God has given us such as food that we enjoy it to the maximum. That's why in our ahadith we have that during when a person's eating the imams say that the angels don't write down the wrongdoings for the individual so that the person doesn't hurry up when they're eating and the imams tell us to chew our food and take long not to eat very fast why in order to enjoy that blessing that god has put in front of us true it's food but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that food and he created this pleasure but he wants us to moderate it in a way where we can enjoy it properly and at the same time not have it control us. And this is what abstention does. Abstention helps us in doing these things. If we look at this verse, and I'll conclude with this verse inshallah since prayer time is almost up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَأَمَّا مَنْ طَغَى وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا فَإِنَّ الْجَحِيمَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَى النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى 
فإن الجنة هي المأوى. God says, as for one who rebels and prefers the life of this world, truly hellfire is the refuge. Refuge meaning where that person is living, ma'wa, where a person goes and stays. As for one who fears standing before his Lord and forbids or abstain, keeps the soul abstaining from evil, truly the garden, which is Jannah, is the refuge. Here, the Quran is describing the person who stays away from obeying their whims and passions and desires. As the person who is living in a state, in a paradisal state, as if you're living in heaven. And this is an opinion that some of our spiritual scholars have that hellfire and heaven are experiences that we have inside of us, that we are currently experiencing them. If we are in control of ourselves, we're living in the Jannah. But if the opposite is true, then we're living in hellfire. Hellfire means to be subjected to our desires and passions and not have that freedom and liberty to control ourselves. And this is one way to look at it, and it's a beautiful way to look at it. In one hadith, a person comes to the Imam السلام, and tells him to pray for him that he is able to go to Jannah, to paradise. And the Imam tells him, why should I pray for you? You are already in paradise. And the man asks him, how is that so? He says, are you not our follower? Do you not follow our wilaya? Are you not an obedient servant of God? He said, yes. He said, this is what Jannah is. You already are in the state of Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us and help us to benefit as much as we can from this fast to be able to enjoy his blessings that he gave us on this earth, the blessing of food, the blessing of health, and the blessing of worshiping him. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.